Um, Mr. Anderson. Here. Mr. Meyer. Here. Mr. Johnson. Here. Mr. LaSalle. Here. Mr. Wallace. Here. Okay. Um, has everyone had a chance to review the minutes? Yes. Okay. We have a motion to approve. I move we approve the minutes. A second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Passed unanimously. Just wanted to share that um, we had the uh, open house for the transportation system plan, and uh, that was uh, a lot of great conversation uh, and, and good energy. And I know we're going to have a report about it uh, a little bit later on, but I just uh, encourage uh, uh, as many of the you know members to be uh, to be at those meetings when they can and 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 partake. But it was a, a good good time and a good good pr uh, process. So with that, uh, John, you want to? Uh yeah, yes, definitely. So our discussion items, we've got a couple right at the front, the State Process School Program and the Holcomb Boulevard Sidewalk Grant application. They're definitely different, but based on the audience, they're, that light is on. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's on. So um, I th my thinking is it makes sense to kind of combine them because uh, we can we can break out a little more of the detail on the on the Holcomb Boulevard uh, sidewalk grant application. Uh, Kathy's very familiar with that. Jonathan's not here, but he's had some involvement in that. Um, John, you may have had a little bit of involvement in that as well. But uh, when you, last week you asked if we could kind of get a little. Um, education on the Safe Routes to School program. So I, I spoke first to our county tra traffic engineer, Joe Merrick, who's testified before this committee before, and he suggested we call Julie Yip, is that right, Julie Yip, with uh, the state, and she's down in Salem, and she suggested we have Lynn Mutri, Mutri show up, and uh, Lynn's done a lot of work with the city of Beaverton more recently and, and others, but uh, she really kind of emphasized your work with the community of Beaverton and the Beaverton School District and probably several, maybe a, maybe they have a TAC group as well. So <clears throat> she's here to kind of give us uh, uh, some education, but it felt a little bit like you kind of wouldn't mind having also a conversation um, that would be good, especially since we've also asked... Um, Michael Sweeten from uh, Holcomb, Holcomb School, and Gail Hoskins from, are you from Holcomb School as well? No, I'm from the district. You're from the district? I'm Ted. You're Ted. <laughs> we like this better. Um, we've had Ted here too. <laughs> we also have Nick Dickerman who's uh, with the uh, Holcomb Neighborhood Association who helped write the grant, Park Place Neighborhood Association, sorry. Um, and maybe work with John and so there's quite a little group up there in Park Place I think that's mm -hmm. uh, interested in transportation initiatives so um, including Jonathan who couldn't couldn't be here tonight so a good group of people um, Bob you're welcome to join the discussion as well I imagine but um, so uh, Lynn why don't you just kind of come up and start that and kind of give us your take on Safe routes to school, and then we'll blend it with Holcomb as much as we can. I'll give you my take, and then see what happens. <laughs> um, I, I have more, but I can't find them. Like, in step five, so <coughs> that's fine. Okay. Maybe we can get one <laughs> for the meeting minutes. But uh, thank you. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks. We can share. Okay. You guys want to come up and just get a little closer here? That way it doesn't feel so. Come on down. The, the <laughs> price is right. <laughs> we won't bite. And we really need you to speak into the microphone. Yes. When, yeah, because it's being um, video recorded, webcast. Yeah, yeah, don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> and uh, if you'll state your name just so uh, and where you live and all of that. Could, uh, yeah. My name is Lynn Mutri. I am with Oregon Safe Routes to School Program, and I live in Lake Oswego. 
Um, I was asked to, John asked me to, to come to this meeting to talk to you about Safe Routes to School. Um, I am, I, yes, he said he talked to Joe Merrick, who, fantastic resource for Clackamas, you probably know Joe, Clackamas County Traffic Engineer. Um, and he referred to Julie, so Julie is the Safe Routes to School Manager for the state, and I am her technical service provider. So I work directly under Julie to go out and visit people. She pushes the money around <laughs> in Salem. I'm the person that goes out and visits Oregon City, Malala, Beaverton, Baker City, wherever they need assistance to, for, for Safe Routes to School. The whole point with Safe Routes to School is to get more kids to walk and bike to school. Um, I also do try to throw out, um, sorry. I'll talk louder. <laughs> <laughs> um, the whole point, yes, yeah, to, get, to get more kids to walk and bike to school. Um, I also like adding walking, walking to and from school, but also throughout the community. A community that has people who walk is a community where other people want to be. It's, for, for me, I might be a little bit uh, sel selfish, but I really think the vibrancy of a community is shown by people outside walking and communicating within the community. Um, so the state Safe Routes to School program um, has, the, it was initially funded with the 2005 to 2009 uh, f federal, it comes from federal funds. Um, you may have heard a problem with the transportation funding issue on, at the feds hasn't been reauthorized yet. So we don't know what's happening for funding issues, but what we have from the state level is providing as much information as possible to people in the community that they can do without funding. So they can utilize our resources. We have a website, and that's on, on your card, um, oregonsaferoutes.org, taking a look at different resources that you can replicate. You don't have to reinvent things. Things are produced for you so you can replicate them. But what, what we are going to be trying to do as well, and I just had a part of providing the service is, is doing webinars that we'll ha be having on a monthly basis to share uh, stories and to, to share the resources. And the last one that we had was looking at doing action plans. And, and John, you may have heard of Julie does suggest people doing action plans as strategic planning basically, to give you a good outline of what you need for Safe Routes to School. And that happened with the, with the Hokum um, program. Doing, I think you guys did an action plan, didn't you? I don't, I don't think so, not now. Okay. No. But to get funding, you need to do one anyway. But also, what we like looking at is, regardless if there's Safe Routes to School funding from that specific pot that has been quite attractive for people to look at, it's a really good basis to, to apply for all sorts of other grants, be it a TE grant <coughs> or a bike and ped grant, which often th those do come available. And that's part of the things that I put on the website. Specifically for Beaverton, um, it is one of the grants I've been managing for the last two years. We have, uh, we, we've been promoting education and, and encouragement projects. Um, and that's what, and I'm sorry, I'll back up a little bit. Safe Routes to School is, yes, getting more kids walking and biking to school, but they do it in, we call it the, the five E's of Safe Routes to School. We start with evaluation, and that's where an action plan comes in. Got to find out how many kids walk and bike now, how many kids could possibly walk and bike, to mm -hmm. look at the, the, poss the, the possibilities and potential. Before you put funding into a bridge, you've got to see how many people are going to use it before mm -hmm. you, you invest the money to do that. Um, so that's evaluation. Then we, we look at education. We want to educate the people. If we're going to build a bridge, we have to educate people how to use the bridge, the, the, the egress, and, and how to get on and off of those bridge. We have to educate. We also have to educate, and, and hearing earlier, about how, how people use sidewalks, how people walk safely, how people bike safely. And that's something that is on our website, again, is looking at bicycle and pedestrian education programs. That through my contract with the state, I can go out and teach teachers that program. And I can, they can, I can model it, and I can just teach kids, or I can teach the teachers that. Evaluation. Encouragement. We've got to encourage people to try walking <coughs> and biking. And it could be if you build a bridge or a sidewalk, but no one's seen a, no one's tried walking and biking there, we encourage it. So 
So there's two big events that the, that the state hosts each year, International Walk and Bike to School Day. It's on the first Wednesday of October of every year. So that's October 3rd this year. It's a, it's a nationwide event. Actually, it's a, it's a worldwide event. It's International Walk and Bike to School Day. But schools who apply for that will get free incentive, incentive stuff. And you can apply to it through welcome at safefruitsofschool.org. And it's a very simple, it can be a complex program that you sign up for, but it can also be as easy as saying, try walking and biking today. That's the first Wednesday of every October? Of every October. Okay. So it's October 3rd this, this coming year. Okay. Um, okay, so that's encouragement. Um, evaluation, education, encouragement, engineering the one that everybody likes talking about. Engineering is building sidewalks, building roads, building intersections so that people can move, pedestrians, bikers, people can move safely uh, to and from school and throughout the community. Engineering costs a lot of money. And it, it comes from, even with Safe Routes to School, we have a separate pot for it. But again, that's, that's being limited. Um, but so the one thing that we try to encourage all jurisdictions is to look at the other E's, the, the evaluation, the encouragement, and the education, because you can start educate, educating tomorrow, whereas to get a sidewalk is going to take you four years mm -hmm. at the earliest um, it, to, to get a sidewalk or an intersection in, implemented. The other thing is enforcement. So that's what I also encourage people to do is partner and with the Traffic Safety Committee is a really good way to do that, but to, to look at partnering with, with enforcement because people who speed through school zones, people who blow through stop signs, they're infringing on the safety of the kids walking and biking to school. With that, if they keep seeing infractions, it makes it a lot more difficult for parents to feel comfortable letting their children walk and bike to school. So that's why we look at the five E's of Safe Routes to School, because it's just multi-pronged. And so we just all try to, try to work together. With Beaverton, yes, we have uh, limited funding. We've had it's two years, it's limited funding, and we're working with 38 schools. And uh, we, we have a half-time person working on it with 38 schools. So it's a very, very small portion. And again, we look at the dollars that we have to spend and the fact that we only have between now and the end of September to spend it, um, what our objective is to have safe walking and biking maps and drop off and pick up maps for each school. So then parents can look at it and say, these are the preferred walking and biking routes for my child to get to school. So that, and then this is, this is how the, the walkers and bikers interact with the other road users in front of the school. So then people can be, we, we try to encourage schools to look at separating, walking, biking, busing, keeping them separate. But in a lot of areas, especially, not I shouldn't say especially with the Beaverton School District, but I see it a lot, is that it's hard to separate because a lot of the designs were built a long time ago. So changing the infrastructure is, is very difficult. But we, we find that, at least with Beaverton School District, with transportation, the only option that they have on their website is busing. So if you are not in the bus area to be bused, you're on your own. And they don't look at potentially walking or biking. It's just assumed that you'll get there on your own. And a lot of parents assume that driving is the only, is the only safe and viable option. Part of the, the, the maps that we produce, we look at the distances that people have to travel, and I, we put on there, this is 0.5 of a mile for a child to walk, and oh, 0.5 of a mile only takes 10 minutes. You know, and, and trying to, so that gets into the health aspect that we really try to promote with Safe Routes to School. Kids aren't getting the exercise that they need. Children, according to CDC, kids should be getting 180, 160 to 180 minutes a week of exercise. With PE, I don't know if you have PE in, in your schools, but even if they have a really good PE program, it's hard to get the 180 minutes of exercise each week. So if kids could walk and bike to school each morning, go home each night, they get some exercise, they come prepared, ready to learn, they've, they've gotten rid of some of their, their, their butterflies in their head and they're ready to learn. So we try to look at it as a multi-pronged approach. Questions. Mm. Uh, one one comment. 
I found a website that is really cool that you guys might already know about, but it's called Ride with GPS, mm -hmm. www, and yep. you're able to build maps and, and tell mm -hmm. us the elevation, how much time, and sp yeah, it's really great. Um, but one, one question I had was, um, you know, there are a lot of uh, service organizations and um, trail alliances, and are you able to work with some of those volunteer organizations and, you know, in, in lieu of funding and, and get their involvement? And, and a, a lot of it is, is, is encouragement, and if you're asking if I could work with them, mm -hmm. um, please keep in mind I work with 180 school districts. Sure. So there's, there's a lot of service agencies out there, and we try to make sure that they all know about the Safe Routes to School program, and a lot of it is putting the onus on the, the actual city and the district to try to either, if the service, if the specific service group within a community wants my information, great. Yeah. But, um, you know, I would, the, a couple of the, the programs, and actually I, I do volunteer, I used to do volunteer work with Joe Merrick at the Boys and Girls Club out, out in, um, sorry, in Milwaukee. And that, again, is trying to explore a community, and we get mm -hmm. out on bikes and try to explore the community. That's great. Yeah, but th there are a lot of service organizations that c could help with a program that we started in several exactly. schools in Beaverton is walking school buses. Right. So trying to look at the routes, and that's part of the mapping, is, and a walking school bus is a school bus without the bus. Mm -hmm. So just walking together with, with parent leaders to tr you know, keep, keep control. And we have on, on, on the website again, we have protocols for doing a, a walking school bus. We have contract forms that people, you know, if you pick a tulip, you're getting kicked off the bus. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so, so there are rules, but again, trying to, encourage it. We do have one school in Beaverton at Sexton Mountain Elementary. It started with one parent, her two kids, and another teacher. And they went every week for two months without anybody joining them. I joined them. Um, now, two years later, we have on average 80 to 100 kids each week walking. Okay. It's the same route. They know where they meet, and they know it's a safe route. Parents feel good just dumping their kids off because they know it's going to be a, a safe, efficient way to get to school. Well, I just encourage you because I know, like, we have so many great clubs, uh, the Optimist Club and mm. Lions and Boy Scouts. And if we were able to get a packet, you know, that would, you know, show, hey, here's an opportunity where you could, you know, do this service project and, and help the kids get to school safe, I think there'd be a lot of uh, response to that. And and, and the one thing, I I'm tr I, I, I was just at a, a meeting all day down in, down in Gladstone and talking to high school uh, principals and teachers because they all, all have service learning projects so wouldn't it be great if the high school kids go out and do Absolutely. the mapping of the routes and take the kids out for yeah. for walks you know high school kids aren't usually too much too interested in safety but if they're conveying safety messages to the kids I think that could be a very valuable learning tool mm -hmm. that's great I you know I, I know Oregon Oregon City is wants to do, and from what I've heard, you, you of course you want to have safety for, for all your residents. Mm -hmm. And so I do encourage you to take a look at, at the schools, and I know there's, we'll, we'll, we could talk a little bit later about the specific schools, but taking a look as well as a, as a city to look at how can we make it as safe as possible for the kids. And if we have to do any retrofitting or if we have to build any schools, make sure you take a look at how those ki children are going to be walking and biking to school or how are they getting to school. A lot of districts are, and we ran into that in Beaverton, which I was there, but I didn't help it. Um, they, f they could afford land out in the boonies. So all the, all, every 100% of the kids are going to be having to have to bus, to be bused to school. Well, now you're seeing a lot, of, a lot of cities, including Oregon City. We just started the Oregon City Trail Alliance. Mm -hmm. And you know that that's the focus. Uh, Canby has one, Wilsonville, mm -hmm. and that their whole focus is is to you know not necessarily safe routes to school, but that's certainly a, a part of that. Mm -hmm. But you know, building connectivity and trails and for bike and ped. And so, yeah. Uh, yes, picking up on the uh, walking school bus, I thought that was an interesting way to describe that. Um, do you have to have a safe route to have that? So if you have sidewalks that are uh, have gaps in them and you there literally is no way you could go from point A to the school and back because of that. 
you do it anywhere you want it. But what I do recommend is you have an area, and if you're going to be walking with a group of 20 kids, are they going to be able to be safe on that route? So that, that's what you have to do is make sure your route has enough room to accommodate the kids. And then that's what we did, especially when we started um, um, thinking specifically of the Sex and Mountain one, is for that first couple of months, it was in essence a riot act that, that mm -hmm. you talk to the kids and say, at certain areas, this is what you'll do. And we do have rules. At every intersection, you stop and we regroup. And th this excuse me, specific school has sidewalks the whole way, but they are starting another route which has um, a, a place where infill is necessary. They have a, a space of about, uh, probably about 50 feet with no sidewalk. It's a very small spot, but they have rules how to get through that area. So you just have to make contingencies and just keeping in mind that kids think a little bit differently than we do. Just one quick follow-up. So is there liability implications with the walking school bus? And if so, how does the school or the city handle that? We haven't had a problem because what it, what it is, is is a volunteer activity. It's not, um, it, it's not that, and a, a, the Safe Routes to School program is directly through the school district, but it's not, it's not, nothing is mandatory. We are not forcing kids to have to do this. So if, and that's, and it's run by volunteers, and even with myself, um, I'm not forcing people to attend a class or a walking school bus, it's all done on a volunteer basis. We take protocols, but it would be, if, if there was a problem, and this is a standard thing we get at all conferences nationwide about liability, um, but because everybody's of course concerned with their kids, but if you take set steps, just like first aid, steps if something happens, it's, it's a good Samaritan's law is what's protecting you. Because you're doing the best you can. Can I ask you, you, you said that Beaverton has, a, you said there's a half-time staff person handling 38 schools. Is that a state staff person or is that a Beaverton School District staff person? It's, it's me quarter time and another person quarter time. It's so Both with the state? It's not with the state. Well, it depends on how you rephrase that. It's, um, I, I wrote uh, a grant for the Beaverton School District. And the Beaverton School District, um, and you may have heard Beaverton sort of hurting for <laughs> budget right now. Well, they all are. They all are. <laughs> but so so I, I became the person to manage that. So it's just um, they didn't have the personnel to be able to, to, st to staff that. So it, it's a, I, I wrote a, it, it's grant funded, if yeah. that probably helps. It's grant funded through the federal well, safe routes program. I'm thinking of yeah. from the school district's yeah. perspective. It's, it's, they're not going to find somebody no. from the school district. So what it is is volunteer. It's, that's, that's often what it is, is um, what, we've, what we're doing for sustainability in Beaverton School District is what we're, we're and that's, it goes school by school. So you look at your, your parent-teacher organizations and look at, we'd like to do a safe routes to school program who's interested. And that's, but that's what we try to tell school districts who are just starting is that we do have resources from the state level to help somebody who is just starting at a school. So they're not completely on their own. But, and that goes back to the service organizations, mm -hmm. is that I can't help with that. It has to come from the local school Ground area. Yeah. yeah. But we can provide the, re so again, the, the resources are there. Right. right. And, and you can call on me. Because I can come to your school to do a, a workshop on on how to do a walking school bus for a PTO meeting, or getting a bunch of a bunch of school school district personnel to do um, how to teach bike safety classes. Perfect. Um, but so that's what that's what Julie Yip, who who John contacted, really wants to make sure that we get out is that we did have grant funding. We really hope we're going to get grant funding again, but at least from a state level, we have the resources and they, and that's, that's what we can provide. So, um, Julie and I talked a little bit more than you and I did about um, the Safe Routes to School program. And um, first of all, I'd, I'd, I'd like to say that um, the Holcomb 
area is pretty feels pretty ripe for projects because we've got neighborhood support and I know we've met before at uh, because of a speeding issue on Holcomb Boulevard so we sat down with the PTA there are a couple of members from your PTA and and uh, Michael and I I think yeah Gail you were there too for that meeting weren't you no so okay I can't remember but I know I've met you before so anyway that that area seems like a hot spot right now for interest um, but the one thing that Julie emphasized was <clears throat> the city and transportation groups like this one can be all for safe routes programs do all they can to sponsor them the school district for that matter can be you know supportive of those ideas but the programs that are most effective are those that really have parents or at least a parent sponsor that um, that really does the work of meeting with teachers meeting with parents going to assemblies putting on these um, awards or, or incentive programs right to get them to work um, so that's one track that I think you know we need to pursue the track of a project that um, funds uh, you know a new pathway that's that's a different tack and I think uh, when those things are when we have those kind of projects that move forward it really is encouraging for the school district and that volunteer because not only are, are, are their efforts being you know seeing some improvements but um, you know th those those common sense connections that are just missing you know to have those everybody recognizes those the minute they go in so it seems like there's <coughs> multiple tracks that you kind of have to follow um, so and the educational piece well, one thing I would like to, to stress to if people are interested in volunteering it, it doesn't have to be that bad again the most successful one in and you can describe it bad but, but um, it, it, it can be as easy or as in-depth as, as you want and a lot of it comes from the support that you get from the school and the, the school cluster area if everybody wants it then <coughs> all it is is motivating mm -hmm. and as you said that just fuels the, the energy behind it um, in a successful I used to uh, run the the Portland Safer to School program and we had 10 volunteers so they had a walking school bus to and from school every day because you had 10 volunteers so one mother was Wednesday morning another mother was Thursday afternoon and they just they just uh, built off of each other and it was exciting um, and it was it was a ton of fun but it, it all depends it, it's all from the local level what does the school want what does the school need but you, you said it right John is that it, it has to come from the, the, the grassroots yeah. I just have one little comment sure you bet um, I live within blocks of Holcomb School so I'm pretty familiar with that situation there and I'd just like to express our gratitude from that neighborhood of any help that you can give us at all because it's uh, that particular part of that Holcomb Boulevard is really really dangerous for those kids That's well maybe it's something that we could we could talk to to plan either late August or early September to look at some mapping and some mapping of the routes for the, the Holcomb Elementary and have a community walkabout mm -hmm. and to look at identifying because that's what one thing that I'm sure the engineering department already has but look what that's what we did with with all the Beaverton schools is a walkabout we call them a, a community walkabout we identify areas that parents feel that they want safety improvements to be done and then we meet and then we prioritize those and we prior, prior you you can prioritize and you can you can work with your engineering department to put a price tag beside them um, to, to look That's at great. what you want to yeah, do but, but then and also you could look at education or an encouragement projects that part of that strategic plan and realizing those, those don't cost anything and so then taking a look at different and, and as we said they don't cost anything and you can start them tomorrow whereas the engineering often does take a little bit longer that free is really really nice free is great <laughs> <laughs> 
But yeah, th so that's what I just like to stress with, with a school that is right and the school that is wanting is using resources and, and call. Yeah. Question? I got a question on how the weather plays a. <laughs> it's not bad weather, it's bad clothing choices. <laughs> that's right, that's right. <laughs> I like that. I'll see a kid walk by, I'll tell her, throw it down, and a t shirt. That's 30 degrees, you know. And not everybody can dress, you know, the role. No, and, and but that's, that's part, of, part of education, and part of um, we, we had a and we ran into that quite a bit in Portland where, where people don't have the means to be able to dress appropriately for the weather. And those are often kids that didn't have an option but, but to walk or bike to school. And so we had a, a clothing exchange program where people bring in clothes and, just, and it's just open and take, take, it, take what you need type of program. Because it, it, the busing, the, 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 and it's federal, that busing kids are bused in middle school if they live beyond a mile and a half and kids are bused if they live beyond a mile for elementary. So that, that's the legalities. But a lot of districts, you can go through, that's part of the walkabouts that we did in Beaverton, you can uh, apply for hazard busing. So hazard busing, if it's you know, walking across McLaughlin, I wouldn't, even with, within, within a half mile, I would not want my child to, to be walking across McLaughlin by themselves, you think? <laughs> But yeah, so those are, are a bunch of things. But yes, weather, we just, it is. And we can't change that. So what we try to do is, is develop programs that can alleviate it for other people. That's great. Any other questions, comments? Well, the, the other thing, because I did kind of suggest we combine these issues a little bit, but in your packet is an application that, um, that uh, I think uh, neighborhood group. I know John, John, um, Jonathan, Jonathan David. David was involved with. I know Kathy was involved with. I, I suspect there was others uh, based on a conversation I had with Nick and uh, John Anderson. So there has, you know, there is this effort underway. These are these are completion of really some of the Holcomb Boulevard plan. And, and you know, while. Holcomb is ripe. It's also got some big challenges because there isn't connectivity there. So this is one of those projects that would be, you know, have some expense to it. But uh, and, you know, the the question that I have is, if that goes in, given the nature of Holcomb, are we still going to see? Are we do do we think we'll see, you know, pedestrians walking? And I I, I wonder about that. Uh, how effective that'll be unless we have the education program, you know, unless we have the Safe Routes to School program. Because this grant was not through Safe Routes to School, was it not? Mm -hmm. It was what, Kathy? It, yeah, it's a TE. TE. And it, it's simply... TE is... Transportation Enhancement. Transportation Enhancement. Right. And it's simply a notice of intent. Um, and then, then, and really, it shows the city submitted it, but it's really the neighborhood who put it together. And um, and so the state will review them all and and de and determine who goes to the next level. Who who should submit an application, an actual application. So this is a good process rather than going through a whole. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. One of the questions that I had, Kathy, when I looked at this recently, was the number. Uh, yeah, and there's a map I'm, with. I'm not thrilled with this map. There's, there's no explanation. So is that the number of houses or the number of students? It must be houses. Right? Houses. Is, yeah, you would. I guess you would know. Home. There's like only this. two houses in Holcomb Hill. Looks like it. Well, that's divided. Uh, Holcomb. Uh, that oak tree. That's Oak Tree Terrace right there, and in that little. Holcomb Hill number two, uh, there could possibly, yeah, it would be correct, six homes. Because they're on, like on uh, one acre lots. But that's just part of that street. He's just trying to emphasize how, what the potential for students 
walking along Holcomb Boulevard would be mm -hmm. if we were to get that connectivity. And, and so obviously what they're looking for is a much bigger financial contribution than an educational program. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, oh, definitely, yeah. But if, if, if you have the, the sidewalk plus an educational program, mm -hmm. yes. plus, but even with this funding, it's still gonna take a long time mm -hmm. to implement. Um, just, it takes, it's a process. Yeah, it's a process. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, they're you know, looking at the number of people that could potentially be walkers because that might be it um, and I don't know you guys might know that that is you know if, if that's a hazard busing area and if it's hazard busing all those kids now are walking so that saves at least one bus and that's a teacher <laughs> um, so, so this right here so at the corner you know that's where Holcomb is right? and so above that so this is really an upgrade okay going up the hill and then above that this is a little bit up here that's an entire bus route. So it has to do a second run. So our attendance area is actually Jackson Hill here. Oh, so seven, Maybe I'm just thinking they're probably going to prefer you. You can both sit up there, um, but I think just to get you. Uh, all right. So if you could state your name again. Yes, thank uh, you. Uh, I'm Michael Sweeten. I'm the principal at Holcomb Elementary. And this is my, just finished my second year there. So. Excellent. Oh, okay. Um, so on the map, where we're at, we're right here on the basically the elbow, mm -hmm. and so above that. So this is really the hill, right? You go up the hill, and then above that, this is an entire run for a bus. It's about fifty-six kids right now. So it's a, you know a bus holds around seventy, you know, a little less, a little more. It depends on kindergartner or sixth grader, right? So um, we also have call it Jackson Hill, this hill as well. So that's one run, and then, so in the morning, it picks up kids on Jackson Hill, to downtown, and then it goes to the school, drops them off, then does a second run, which is this neighborhood, picks them up, and then brings them to school. They have, they usually get there about five minutes before eight, and we started it. So they're really close, but, and you know, they're rushing and getting their breakfast sometimes to take it to class. Um, in the afternoon, it's the opposite. Um, they get on the bus first, bus takes them up the hill up here, drops them off really quick, comes back while all those kids wait at the school for about 30 minutes-ish. Um, not quite 30 minutes, but by the time school's out all the way until the bus gets back, it's kind of like that. Um, and that's an entire run, and then it takes them to the Jackson Hill. So that would eliminate an entire run there. Um, one of the things that we talked about last year, John and I, and there were some concerned parents about that is since the sidewalk has come in now, so this side of the hill is now walking for a mile, but this side is still not. All of this is hazard because there's no crosswalk anywhere on Holcomb Road. So that's kind of this safe route to school. That's kind of where we're exploring what it is that we're looking at. Um, but a concern for parents right now is still the speed on that road. And we talked about that. That's really not something that we regulate or I guess the city regulates. That's something kind of the state does, I guess. I understand now. No? Is that right? So that again. Didn't we learn that the state is kind of the one that regulates the speed on Holcomb? Wasn't it they do a survey of how fast over oh, time? Oh, well, the state sets speed limits. Right. <coughs> right. right. And that's so, true. and that's a 40 mile per hour road. And so that was also a deterrent, even for the kids who are walking on this side now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, of the kids who actually walk, we probably have maybe 50 and my school is around 540 so um, and those kids are usually the ones in the housing that are right adjacent to Holcomb I mean because they're basically not having to walk in the Hol on Holcomb Road they're actually just walking through we own that property that is right there where our sign is now um, on Holcomb Road so that little triangle and then right behind Next to that is where housing starts down the hill. I think that's an interview or something like that. Something. View Manor, thanks. And so that's that's right here. And they're primarily most of the kids who walk are in that. Um, but everybody else is bused. So it's a lot of busing for school. We probably we have 
five buses. We'll probably have six buses next year. And you're correct, um, Oregon City as a district, um, as you guys probably know, we're closing two schools this year. Um, so Mount Pleasant and King, those are our two biggest walking schools in our district. We have to close them because they're smaller. One of the things with that is that urban schools, if they're built too long ago, they're not very big. And so it's not efficient because basically one principal and 400 kids or another one principal and 550 kids, you know, those are the things that you say when you close the school. So we decided to close the schools as opposed to increase class sizes. Um, that's the other thing. I mean, a school district is pretty much made up of people, right? That's the expense. So you either have to cut somewhere, and so it's either teachers or administrators, things like that. So by closing the schools, we keep the class sizes down because that's a priority for the school board. Um, but uh, you, you cut the like the administrator, the secretaries, the custodians, things like that. So um, by doing that, all of the schools now, though, are on the periphery of the city. So you have John McLaughlin, Daphne Lane, Beaver Creek, Redmond, Holcomb, and Kenny Lane's James Lodge, which is actually uh, in the annex, way out there. Mm -hmm. So um, I think, did I have them all? Yeah, there'll be six-ish, right? Kenny Lane, James Lodge, really one school. So, um, that's, so that's exactly right. Most of those kids will now be bused. Kind of what we're looking at. So we have the potential in this area, but I think as we look at the whole development, there's certain factors that we'll have to consider with that for sure. Thanks. The one thing I'll, I'll just finish with, with Safe Foods to School. The one thing I was saying is a really good, viable, safe option to get to, to get kids to and from school. That's what we've we, um, Beaverton has really gone for the walk by bus program because a lot of kids, or not a lot, but there are some schools where the buses yeah, are only 25. The microphone, yeah, there you that, go. That, that, that buses are only 25 percent full because parents would rather drive their kids to school. Hmm, sure. Often it's time you can drive to school in 15 minutes or get on a bus an hour early. Right. Um, but. We, we do encourage bus riding as well as a good as a good option. The one thing, I, I am a really big fan of the whole walk and bike project, if you can do more of it for help. And, mm, and sure. it's, kids gotta move. And it really gives them really good safe, safe um, safety lessons that they grow up with. So there, there are roughly 10% of the students at Holcomb that, that are, are walking from, from the um, housing, um, is by doing the connectivity, um, do we do you anticipate that, that that will increase? Yeah, so that would be another 60 kids. Just from up above, up here, you'd have mm -hmm. at least 60 more that could walk. Okay. Yeah, so, <coughs> yeah. I mean, all of this neighborhood, which is right here, is all within the one mile. Got so it. technically, yeah. they would all walk. But like you were talking about, we've actually had the um, request from the state that that's an unsafe area to cross Holcomb, mm -hmm. that, that we can actually bus them. Because really, though, I mean, if we're right here <laughs> and we're busing people, you know, that far, but as you know, Holcomb is quite the street. So. Yeah. Another thing you could put a petition for is put a crossing. <laughs> no. Well, we talked about that. I mean, but uh, again, crossing a 40, I mean it's, I mean, like you said, McLaughlin is 40 miles per hour, Holcomb is 40 miles per hour. Yeah. That's a five lane street, this is a two, but right. the speed is the same. So a five year old or, you know, a seven year old and crossing that, it's, I have to have concerns. So mm -hmm. that's the education piece. But you're right, if there was a, uh, what do we call them, a walking bus program, then, uh, and a signalized Head crossing, you know, and maybe some reduced speed. You know, I mean, all those factors, you know, sure. kind of play that into a, an, an opportunity that some parents would would allow their child to do. Right now, you know, I, even if you're sixth grade, I don't think parents want their kids crossing Holcomb Boulevard in that area. But, but there are options, and, mm -hmm. um, and it starts with education, education and encouragement to get people to say. First of all, knowing how to do it safely, but and then encouraging them to try it, and then doing it safely when they do. And if it's not safe, 
you don't have any alternatives and that's well, I, I really want to commend the the group that did. I know, John, you were involved in helping to... Actually, Jonathan and Nick and some others did more work, so... Yeah, I mean, it's just excellent to see, you know, that, that kind of from the ground up effort to partner with the school district and others to put, you know, make our roads safe for the kids, so it's just awesome, yeah. So... Well, thank you. I took lots of notes, and and uh, you know we've started an organization that we hope to call and try and tie in and connect dots. And my information. And yep. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. You have a card. John, just out of curiosity, what is the, is, is there a process, I'm sure there is, but do you know the process for um, applying to reduce the speed, say from 40 to 35? Well, um, we're going to go through that process. We've done it before. Um, I think the most recent one I remember is Lynn Avenue when mm -hmm. we did that one, but we're actually working on the South End Road request for the state to look at South End Road. Uh, in the area of the school um, because I think you come in on that at 40, you hit a 20 mile per hour school zone, then it goes back to 40 for a short distance, and then it gets to 35. And so we're asking them to look at a, or we will be asking them to look at a 35 mile. And so they come in and they do their speed analysis and they really look at what the traffic is doing in the 85th percentile. Mm -hmm. So if traffic is, you know, the, the, the problem that we've run into is. Um, the speed data doesn't support the reduced speed zone. So if the, if the boulevard feels comfortable enough, as I'm guessing Holcomb would, um, because while it's at 40, what, what I hear from neighbors is traffic's, you know, using, going 50. Right. Yeah, and especially going down that hill. Yeah. yeah. So. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. Appreciate it. She so, said bend, not bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, the boulevard and the nature of the boulevard, the, the geometric design of the boulevard is such that it, it uh, facilitates faster traffic. And, and just setting the speed zone at something less than that doesn't necessarily slow the traffic. So, John. So another option I've seen is uh, on arterials that have 40 45 miles an hour if there's a school there they'll say 20 miles an hour when the lights are flashing mm -hmm. yep. and I've seen those in some heavy traffic areas that are very similar to Holcomb so that would be something that could be investigated yeah we've looked we looked at that when we were looking at the school zone and that was an option that we we would like to do it's one of those sites that we sh that we talked about for Inclusion in the transportation system plan for s signage, you know, right. um, that could be programmed to be activated during certain school hours. The other places, mm -hmm. the high school and uh, on Beaver Creek Road, South End Road could use it. You know, those are those are pla those are our high kind of complaint areas where the traveling public gets frustrated with a school zone that lasts, you know, from seven to five because there really isn't. Their school activity, even though there's, you know, classes are going, there's not ped pedestrian traffic. So that's an option there. Um, but to do that, John, it's it's not only the cost of the signs. There's the connectivity of conduits between the two signs to make sure they're activated at the same time. So that was a costly project, but um, but. not right on Holcomb um, well what uh, I think that no this this the problem was we we posted that we posted that corner as a school zone from eight to five or seven to five, seven to five when is that what it was that yeah, was one show so we posted that it hadn't been posted you know when we took over Holcomb um, from the county the county and Joe Merrick has got a good point here. They never, they didn't post that as a school zone. Well, when we took it, we said, "Well, let's post it," and that created just as much grief as it had before. 
um, because it was when children are present. And in order for it to be posted when children are present, the children, you know, in order for the police to actually write a ticket for that, the child has to be either near the crosswalk or, you know, there was a particular, I don't remember the exact law, but they have to be either about to step in the crosswalk or in the crosswalk. And if that's not happening, police won't ticket. So it was kind of, uh, and there wasn't a lot of pedestrians there anyway. You know, there was a few. Most of the pedestrians that you have, like you said, are coming up through that, um, uh, through the, the housing development as opposed to walking up the sidewalk up Holcomb Boulevard. So there was very few, um, if anything, it was high school students that were gathering at the bus stop. But even that, because there's, there's a bus stop right out in front, even having the students at the bus stop wasn't enough for our police <clears throat> to enforce or feel like they could do a good job enforcing <clears throat> because they weren't at the crosswalk. So <clears throat> the right way to do it is when... She, oh, and, and I guess the other thing is we didn't feel good about the idea of posting it from 7 to 5. Yeah. That was the deal. Mm -hmm. So the only other option is when... When the flashing. school zone's flashing, and that's a costly endeavor at that location. Uh, well, most locations, because you know you want the, the 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 technology isn't strong enough to where you got wireless communications beside between signs. So, but that that um, is that covered in Jonathan's uh, uh, grant uh, proposal here. The possibility I, um, of, is that an option that's uh, available to study? I would have to across? study it a little closer. I, I thought it was only sidewalks, but um, there's... He doesn't exclude it. Yeah, he's not excluding it. Construct yeah. sidewalks, bicycle lanes, crossings, and installed lighting. So um, I haven't... Yeah. Well, it seems to me like it would be a... That should, yeah. yeah. Well, and again, I'll... John's heard me say it a couple of times here, as I guess some other members have. If you can get this clear enough, you might be able to do an LID to pick up some of these more expensive things that would get it right finally. And I mean, it doesn't hurt to explore that. So if the money isn't available elsewhere, and if this makes a big difference to the neighborhood, you know, maybe that's one approach. Um, well, it seems to me like this is kind of what comes first, the chicken or the egg. If you have these crosswalks, but you have no place for the kids to walk on because there are no sidewalks, yeah. what's the point? So I would think the sidewalks would be the primary first issue. And then down the line, mm -hmm. maybe the crosswalks could eventually happen. What I notice is on Holcomb, there's, there's a trail that leads to the... Um, see on my map if we look at that map so um, the Whitkey Estates and Holcomb Ridge area if you look on this map with the red lines there is a pathway that gets you up to Holcomb Boulevard and up, there's even a place for a pedestrian crossing but it's right beyond it's, it's just downhill of the curve okay, right the are you guys following me there, Bob are you uh, okay, right um, you see where I'm talking about on the it, map? Is it about where the H is? This it is says Holcomb Hill? Right. Um, trail comes yeah, down here. It's just below that. Right? Okay. It's kind of adjacent to the, yeah, the piece that Holcomb. fronts yeah, Holcomb Boulevard. And then there's um, there's also at here. Oak Tree Terrace, where Oak Tree Terrace yeah. Yeah. comes out. School kids wait there for the bus. Some of these are high school kids. But the big group that I see nice. is up near Barlow Crest. I mean, mm -hmm. the last time I was up there at school time. I don't get up there often. It may have been the last time we were there just kind of monitoring that. I mean, there's about 20 kids out there, and that may be for a variety of different bus okay, loads. So, so, and th all of those kids, I, I don't know if they're required to cross or if they pick up on both sides, but the day I was there, they were only on one side of Holcomb. So it seems like there's really three places where crossing is uh, hap occurring pretty regularly. And, um, you know, I don't think we can extend the school zone that far, or, but it seems like even one pedestrian crossing up there would be pretty well used. 
I don't think so. Depends on if you're behind the school bus when it stops, how many children are on it. <laughs> Sometimes right. it seems like they're about 75. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, this bus is stopped. The bus hasn't stopped yet. Yeah. Or maybe when you, when they're getting off, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. You know, we drive by uh, uh, Mount Pleasant. You know, they have, uh, looks like to me, parents and then the kids all on their safety, you know, with their flags and orange cones and all of that and that takes some level of organization is that possible at Holcomb where you know to get crossing guards uh, to help out you know I think the only thing that's striped is the driveway uh, to the school maybe the driveway I don't think he, I don't think it's it's not striped even for the driveway for the apartments uh, or for the like, front, like the main entrance there as it crosses like towards that church. I think there's those lines, right? Maybe not. Yeah, I don't think Holcomb's got marked crosswalks. Yeah. No. I mean you could do that. It's pretty far. Um, so that's Swan is the next major street, street down, um, down to actually cross the street. Um, or up, up you can't actually make it up there without because there's no crosswalk. Yeah, yeah, that'd be. <laughs> so basically, it's um, when we're looking at this. Yeah, you know, these aren't. This is the. the Development, but then you come down to Swan. That's the mm -hmm. first actual kind of intersection okay. to get across. And then going up, it's actually not until this development up here. Yeah. Oh, right up there. Yeah. All right, I'm just trying to. Oh, that's good. This is <laughs> unusual here. This map setting, so. I gave up on it. This is where I need only use the old system. I know that a little better. I guess the crosswalks um, is, are kind of far from We're too school. far, yeah. yeah so yeah. I mean, we could organize that, but it would be kind of, I wouldn't know if they were happening. <laughs> I yeah. guess that, it would so really if we had the sidewalks out. in and the crosswalks available, then that might be an option. I know coming, to, I go by Mount Pleasant every day, and, and the orange cones, uh, they just put a, you know, several, you know, probably three dozen of them out there. And boy, I tell you what, that really is effective. It's slowing everybody down. And that's not good. Mount Pleasant, that's what I meant. Yeah. But you won't see I'm not going to map Yeah. You know, here's Swan. I think, you know, it's both distance and elevation. That's another little factor is, Elevation's you know, we're on elevation. a slope. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. but this is a neighborhood, there's a pathway that, that leads from from this area here, mm -hmm. and we'll get you out on Holcomb, and then yeah. you can come up and go. Um, so if you had a crosswalk cross. right at that point where the path comes out to yeah. Holcomb, yeah. that mm -hmm. would be, mm -hmm. makes yeah. sense. The, the only crosswalk I know of is across the driveway. I, I don't think we have one on the drive. On I, I don't think there's any crossing right. Holcomb. That's I think crossing right. Holcomb. Yeah. yeah. And we do, and even though there is that crosswalk there, there's no. Sidewalk on the other side. Sidewalk on the, on, <laughs> on on the, the uphill side, side of that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. so. and it, even if you go uh, farther east and you get, the, uh, is it Winston, the intersection of Holcomb? Right, right, right there? Mm -hmm. Now that's a typical four street intersection and there's no crosswalk painted there either, even though there's curbs on both sides and sidewalks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kids do cross there. That's yeah, so you could have you know some improved safety markings there for kids to cross. Yeah, it's not exactly a mid crosswalk, but it's right at the entry to the city, and uh, you know the, there's some speed there. I, mm -hmm. I know, and there's that question of we've got the same uh, suggestion at South End Road, if you remember, at Par right. Partlow, right. where property owner suggesting we stripe a crosswalk and the traffic engineer is recommending not striping that without any kind of pedestrian signalization, signalization yeah. and I you know this this area other than the fact that the kids are using it um, you know, with nothing but um, you know, we, 
I, we would, we, I agree that that I would say for well. that one there, as someone who's going to fill this interim role as a city engineer, I'd be a little bit worried without a recommendation from a transportation engineer that said, you know, you know, we recommend you place a crosswalk there with just standard signage. Mm -hmm. My guess is they're going to say, no, you should do PET-activated lighted signage. There. Sure. Um, yeah. You know. And there's the funding issue again. So right. Bob, did you have something? Well, I just, I, my opinion is I would feel uncomfortable with a crosswalk there due to the speed that the cars traveled through there. Uh, even if they saw somebody attempting to use the crosswalk, Trying to slow down from 50 or 55 miles an hour in time would be more dangerous, and that false sense of security of anybody using the sidewalk, I think, would be kind of dangerous. Yeah, you. I mean, want, using the crosswalk. You'd want warning, flashing sign, signs, you know, even further out. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you for coming. Well, that was helpful to go through that and come, become aware of some of those projects, or concerns, rather. Okay. Any uh, questions, comments, uh, just to finish off that section and move on to the transportation system plan? I have one quick question. Sure. Other than uh, informational, is there any action required on any of these? This is simply an application? And it was already submitted by the city, so we just wait, correct, to find out it's how this uh, letter of intent uh, yeah. gets handled. Yeah, it's not an application. It's a letter of intent. And so we're just waiting. I don't know what the uh, notification date will be, but um, the state will be notifying the city um, if we're shortlisted and if we should if we're supposed to submit an application and at that point we somehow have to f figure out a way to come up with a portion of the funding mm -hmm. and you know because there's always a, a match right but that'll occur over the summertime okay, yeah. John Okay, so this item is um, just an update on the city's transportation system plan update. Um, last week was loaded with uh, transportation system plan meetings. We, uh, the consultant team and staff uh, attended the June 11th planning commission agenda, uh, planning commission meeting, and also the city commission meeting on June 12th work session. Thank you again for coming. Thank you very much. Um, we also had um, our stakeholder advisory team meetings and our technical advisory team meetings last week. And then last night we had a um, transportation system plan open house. And um, we also um, I, I attended the farmer's market talk to anybody that was willing to listen about transportation system plan and uh, Laura today went to the ODOT 99E open house so there's a pr paving project on 99E that's coming up uh, that ODOT was having a, a public open house to talk about so she went and attended that so it's been pretty heavy with regard to the transportation system plan they're, they're getting uh, quite um, focused on the solution section, which is a pretty interesting section if you haven't read it. Um, I've read part of it. I've looked at a lot of the graphics, and um, I thought the open house was good because they had bigger maps. My eyesight is a little challenged with some of these little <laughs> maps. Um, but uh, the all, all the meetings that I attended, the presentation was pretty similar. They're talking about goals and criteria and objectives for how we start narrowing that um, long list of community transportation needs to something that's affordable. And so it really kind of brings all those other chapters into play with regard to, um, you know, you read the goals in chapter 
two and some of the you know some of the things that you read in earlier chapters they really don't mm-hmm. make sense until you, until you start kind of for me anyway until now they make sense but they it, re- it really starts to gel when you start thinking about real projects and real needs and what do we need for intersection improvements and where do we want connectivity to happen and where are our ped and bicycle needs and so um for those of you that attended that, uh, I, I think you probably picked up on a little piece of that. Um, the other thing that uh, I wanted to add was we what we heard from the stakeholder advisory um, team meeting uh, was th- they were feeling like they weren't getting uh, good good feedback. And I think John kind of alluded to this even at our last meeting. Was trying to get feedback. Uh, from the experts, if you will, on questions or concerns. And so um, that uh, the stakeholder group asked specifically that the committee think about that problem and figure out how to get back to them. The other thing that they mentioned was right now we've got <clears throat> 102, probably a few more, but when uh, the citizen comments on the interactive map, there's several... Um, comments that have been made that, that warrant responses. And so Laura took all that information that we've received over the last three months and put it in a table and we're trying to assign it to, to different staff or consultants that can answer those questions. And that's not necessarily a small task. Um, and I, I saw my name on a few of them and a lot on Nancy's. I don't know if she's going to get to them all, but we're, we're going to work, continue to work through that and try and deliver the, that feedback back to the people who have asked those questions because I've, I've heard in the few people that I've communicated that have actually made comments, concerns about the fact that, man, I made a comment, you know, two months ago and I haven't heard, heard anything. So I think that's a good move as well. We also met with, with John. We had a, a meeting with John uh, to talk a little bit more about some of the things that he had uh, not everything. He had a lot of sticky tabs, but he's reading these chapters, by the way. But he had all kinds of, of sticky tabs of questions and comments and things, and uh, we couldn't really cover it. And we were together for maybe an hour and a half or so, and we probably we couldn't cover all that. But um, I think it was still productive. Uh, I appreciated it. You Thank got you. you got you know probably your your top top three or four big issues out of that. So I thought, and and I learned a little bit out of that as well. So. Um, TSP is moving along real well. Um, there's going to be a bit of a glitch with Nancy leaving as a project manager for that. And then Laura uh, is going to be leaving on maternity leave mm-hmm. fairly soon, too. And that, so both of those have uh, me real concern. Kathy hasn't thought about that yet, but I'm, uh, she doesn't know it yet. But she's going to have to help me get through some of those meetings that are scheduled for that time that Laura's not around. Um, but the consultant team's moving forward. You know, now <laughs> is the prime time to provide comments. Um, you know, our transportation system plan update is only as good as the reviews we do and the comments that we make. So, um, if you, if you, uh, this actually, I can't remember. I think there's actually, um, uh, no, there's not names, but I think there are names associated with each of these comments. So I'm going to count up to see how many of yeah, you have. Too. I'm going to count up to see how many of you have made comments. <laughs> if you yeah. haven't, you're going to we're going to report that next time. There you go. <laughs> no, you don't have to report online. Uh, I think these interact. That one of the challenges, Laura, and I could sense it from Laura because she sent out an email today. You know, she's doing all she can to kind of get the word out. She's sending Mm -hmm. messages to churches, and, you know, it's in the bill, and, you know, we've got flyers, you know, about open house. She's, you know, Lloyd Purdy downtown's been hand-delivering them. And and so we have an open house, and there was um, three from the consultant. Laura and I were there, um, you know, active citizen participants that we typically see. William and Blaine were there. Uh, other than that, there was maybe five citizens that show up for that. And um, so how do you get more participation in those kinds of studies? And uh, it doesn't mean you have to review 
all the chapters, really. They had graphics there that you could look at and say, that's not right, or how's that going to work, or I don't, you know, I don't think you guys are thinking about that uh, appropriately, you know, and so, um, so anyway, I guess this meeting is another way to kind of get the word out that, you know, provide your inputs, they're meaningful. It's not just about staff trying to make suggestions. You, you'll, you'll, you'll get a I'm sure you'll get a, a pretty good um, update, but it won't be as good. I think. Well, a part of it, part of it too, is is that if you if you I mean, you have the professional staff that have you know studied all of these things as part of their career, mm -hmm. and so they're the most knowledgeable and ex expert on these things. If you went if you move forward with the consultants and the planners, and never had. And you know, made an open house available for input. Mm -hmm. You would most likely hear about it, but <laughs> since you know you make it available and the people don't show, you know, uh, I mean that that's a message too that, that you know that they uh, trust what you're doing and and move forward. So yeah. yeah. Just a quick follow up on that. Um, if you could highlight within each neighborhood association area the major projected traffic changes and then you could send them out so that when they had the neighborhood meeting like at Park Place you're not looking at the rest of the town you're looking in their backyard because when it's in their backyard then they may show up and you have to figure out a way so that the neighborhood association when they send out a newsletter or an email advertising that meeting could maybe pick the top three things like uh, you know we're gonna put a four-lane road through here <laughs> something to get people's attention and and then I think you would get people out at a meeting and I you know that's something that can happen down the line um, but I, uh, it's really, you know, everybody's busy. Um, it's a partnership with the professionals. They delegate this stuff to the professionals. You feed it back and try to get people to get involved, but oftentimes it doesn't happen. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. I guess I always trust the professionals, but I also worry that if they're not as familiar with the city as we are, they miss things. You know, I saw some connectivity maps that I thought, well, you know how's that going to work? Yeah. And you know they're convinced because you got to show connectivity. Yeah. Even ODOT has been you know uh, suggesting connectivity uh, or connections that don't necessarily. I mean, don't make sense. Yeah. You know. So you you yeah you know. I'm worried that I worry a little bit that we don't that we might miss some of those. One of the things that might help our committee is at the uh, stakeholders meeting which I attended that was the first time I heard the consultants in the presentation say very explicitly this is an area in which you need to decide the level of service you want and that was talking about the level of congestion at various intersections mm -hmm. and so he was spelling out this is an area you're going to have some decisions to make if staff in thinking about what this committee has to do whether it's a list of three or 15 say these are the places we're going to expect you to be making some decisions recommendations obviously we're making the final decision but these are the areas where we're looking for recommendations because it's a lot of paperwork and some of the chapters have been revised and updated and it's not easy to pull out where those division decision points are but to me that was very clear and I think it'd be a good example uh, it would help us get a focus mm -hmm. yeah going along with that John I think that the more specific if, if there were you know we plan to do this this and this you know then that gives you like well I agree with that or I don't agree with that but when it comes to ideas for you know now, it was very helpful for me to be, and just in a conversation with Laura and and uh, and the consultant, 
and a couple of ideas. The lawyer says, "Oh, you should go over and write those down," you know. And but you know, I before the meeting, I couldn't have thought of that unless I was in that conversation. Maybe that's just me, but but uh, so. Yeah, one of the things in this chapter nine was there was some um, criteria. Uh, actually, no, it wasn't shown in chapter nine. It was like chapter three that showed the goals and objectives. And they were actually, uh, the consultant team was saying, right now we're just weighting these equally. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, right. is safety the top priority or is green streets, you know, is green right. streets, that was the one example I remember because I kind of commented on it was, you know, is, which is more important, you know, safety or, or utilization of, you know, green street um, mm -hmm. technologies. And maybe safety should have a higher weight, you know. So they were really looking to the, the stakeholder group, and uh, I think they asked the same thing of the of the technical group. So, uh, I mean, that would be a, a good one for us to make some decisions on. So if we had a chance to talk about it at one meeting and then make some recommendations that would go forward, you know. Mm -hmm. One challenge for this group is we don't meet this summer. Um, so right. as a group, anyway, I, that doesn't mean we couldn't have... Um, you know, a small little work group to meet on that, but um, and yet the transportation system plan schedule continues to trudge forward. So, but I hear you. I just that may be something you think about as a group if you want to do something different than that. If mm -hmm. you want to schedule a meeting specific to that, and yeah, we can talk about that and communicate through email. Oh, sorry. Um. Can you come up to the microphone? Sure. <clears throat> I believe his name was Carl. I can't remember his last name. He was a consultant, I believe, uh, at the Planning Commission meeting. The uh, last one we had when this was presented to us on sort of an update. Eventually, it came down to dollars and cents. It says, sure. if you put everything in your wish list, we couldn't afford it. We can only afford half the jug handle, which came out, I think, the jug handle came out at 22 mil, and we had enough eggs in the basket to afford about half of that. So if you go out to the public and you get all their suggestions and what have you and get their anticipation, wow, we're going to get all this stuff, and yada, yada, yada. Uh, you might, we might be shooting ourselves in the foot in the sense that we can't afford, uh, uh, you know, what what the public really expects because we went out and told them to get feedback and stuff like that. So you know, it's a catch twenty two situation. If money was, uh, you know, wasn't an issue, you know, and every Clackamas County is trying to figure out how to come up with twenty five million dollars for a mass transit pledge. But on a small scale, uh, like Oregon City, you know, we we just can't, uh, we just don't seem to be able to have the funds available to us to make all the improvements for your transportation plan that you that you'd like. So th I think this is uh, a key element: is really what can we afford, mm -hmm. and how much can we afford to to grow? Because mm -hmm. if we grow beyond our transportation plan and, and have uh, don't have safe streets for pedestrians and and even cars, you know. Uh, even though they're better protected, then really, what what have we accomplished? So we've got to stay within that scope of this, as we address the public. You know, this is what we can't afford. What would you prefer us to do? You know, like uh, uh, John says, terrible to name that fridge. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I I would really sincerely hope that we keep that in mind because the public still has that. You know, they still got their hand on their on their wallet. And uh, even though they, you know, it, it talks cheap, and uh, they want those safe neighborhoods and 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 what have you, but uh, uh, this is the thing that stuck out to me uh, yeah. uh, when he made his presentation. I said, "Whoa, you know, yeah. where do we go from here?" Okay. So anyway, yeah, thank you. Just thought you probably already know this. Sure, you know? sure. That's <laughs> yeah. funny. The eight hundred pound gorilla. The <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of truth to that. So. Well, along with, sorry, sorry. John. Along with what he's saying is then we've got to get better at when we do bring it to the public 
somehow letting them know that you know if we can raise the money for this through taxes or whatever then you know we can have it for you and we are moving along too in our schedule so well, that's, uh, yeah go ahead. the one outstanding challenge that the public sector has is getting the word out getting the word out to people and that's communication it really is communication between boards between planning commission the city city commission the staff the this and that there's always something that falls through the cracks and it always proves to come back to bite you mm -hmm. but how uh, I, I don't know how to do that you know uh, I've never <laughs> solved that problem there's a thousand different ways you can do it but which is the most cost-effective is 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 the key to this thing and if you have that exchange back and forth you've at least got the public on your side and they begin to trust these guys know what they're talking about they're making the best efforts mm -hmm. what have you. it might not come out to be the the Taj Mahal but at least we got our oar in the water and, and what have you so uh, the money and communications those two things you can stay right on top of all the time yeah well maybe we need a transportation Facebook page <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Okay. That's all I had on that. Item. Okay. Um, if possible, it would be good to be done by eight. But uh, uh, you know, if we want to move on to the next, any other comments or questions? Um, if not, then let's go to the downtown parking. Okay. So um, at our last meeting, there was a fair amount of discussion about whether. This committee should be, you know, more in the know and more uh, uh, been asked. But this is an issue that's kind of, I think, moved beyond the committee and reached the city commission level. And uh, what I what I learned after our meeting was um, there is a parking advisory committee. I think that came together as part as a, you know, it's not. A, I don't think it's a committee like this is a committee, but it's a parking committee of people who were concerned about this particular problem. So. The city commission, uh, I think, directed the city manager to put together a committee, which he had done, and he's been meeting with that committee. And I think the outcome of that was direction to staff to find more handicap parking downtown. Yes. So, um, what what came out of that was at least two additional park uh, uh, handicap access parking spaces. Uh, for a total of six downtown um, and I, f I found uh, the locations of all those I didn't get them to Kathy so that she could include them in the package but there's uh, there will be a total of six downtown handicapped parking spaces two of them which I think are the newer ones will be in the county county parking area um, near <coughs> minimums um, there will be one more that's in front of the courthouse, um, another one that's in front of the elevator or near the elevator, uh, and then two new ones, or, or here's the two new ones. There must have been existing parking in some of the county's parking lot. The two new ones, there's two there already. The two new ones, so that, that's my mistake. The two new ones, one's on 6th near um, Christmas at the zoo. Does everybody know where that mm -hmm. business is? And then another one on Eighth, um, in the diagonal parking near near Main Street. So this must be the block between between Main and Railroad. And uh, I did find some construction plans for Main Street that show uh, four of those new sites. Um, and yeah, that one on Eighth Street is is adjacent to Bush Furnishings. So I think the one near the courthouse is on 9th Street. So 7th, 6th, 8th, 9th, they're all going to have them. And, and then um, I guess a couple on on Main Street itself. So and it looks like when they're, they're all said and done, there'll be 11 downtown of the handicapped. Six. Six. This I thought that's what I saw. Yeah, it says 11 here. Yeah, it says 11 in the... 
I was just wondering if this might include future, um, if once implemented, this is the, in the press release. Fourth paragraph down, John, after the one through four, last line, downtown up to have 11. Oh, yeah, 11. Increase the number of handicap access public parking stalls downtown to 11. I wonder what boundary they're talking about. Yeah. Hmm. Well, unfortunately, I don't know where the other five spaces are. But based on that press release, that's what came out of this committee. Yeah. I knew of. I knew of the ones that are going to be restriped on Main Street, and I I spoke specifically to Nancy on this to get the six, but um, so I I guess I don't have a good answer for the difference there. But this well, this kept, eleven came out of that parking advisory committee, so I read this earlier. I didn't I didn't uh, I can't remember exactly, but I wonder if the if there are five more six now and then five later. I, I didn't, uh, Could some of these stalls be the ones on private property? Well, it says additional four four hour parking on Sixth Street on the Bluff. So that wouldn't really be downtown. No, that's no. visitor parking. That's visitor yeah. parking. Yeah. <clears throat> but it is encouraging, uh, you know, to see that kind of response to. Um, you know something that there was a lot of um, concern about the handicap parking and and so I'm, I'm encouraged to see that yeah I wish I knew that. do you know if Nancy's still here no hmm. she might anywhere she was <laughs> yeah I don't and yeah, that's unfortunate uh, my my sense is they're beyond and somewhere you know beyond 10th Street mm -hmm. and that's being considered downtown as well so so that's a bit of misinformation so I, I can't correct that until our next meeting I suppose but sounds pretty aggressive with regard to handicapped parking stalls downtown mm -hmm. and it might be a typo <laughs> I doubt it. Probably not. I doubt it. Yeah. I just don't think I got exactly complete information in mind. I see mind. other typos, but that, I don't think this one. I don't it's think that's one. Yeah. Okay. We included your trolley packet, uh, or the trolley schedule in your packet. The only other thing I'll add in that is um, we basically got, I don't know if the schedule, I didn't compare my notes to the schedule, so I hope I'm not misstating another thing but basically from June 15th around June 15th to just around Labor Day we've got that free shuttle um, we can't necessarily afford year-round full-time trolley service um, exactly I'd like to <clears throat> talk about that trolley service in more detail than we would have time for tonight if I could because I've got some real issues with the underutilization of that trolley service and where the funding possibly can come from because during a work session of April 10th uh, the commission, Commissioner Smith stated there might be money available from the Oregon City Tourism Council. I don't know if anything ever came of that, but there's a lot more issues here that I think we could look into and possibly utilize that trolley system more and generate money from it. Money to, not necessarily profit money, but money to cover the cost of the trolley. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if anybody else has as much interest as I seem to do. Well, yeah, I think that's a an important issue. Uh, you know, sustainable uh, services are always 
Uh, good to have. Um, I'd like to learn more about the program. I don't know enough about it myself. I don't I know either. If, if you others know. No, I'd be open for learning more about it. So. Well, how about um, if we ask Nancy Bush to come to our next meeting to give us an update on trolley 101, if you will. And yeah, <laughs> that would be helpful. Yeah, yeah. it would be. And, you know, what, what are the goals, and, and is it meeting the goals, and, and uh, you know, those kinds of things, some metrics and, and whatnot would be good. Yeah, because she process. said one, at one time that it was only for downtown use. But if you look at the map, it certainly goes far beyond downtown. Mm -hmm. It used to have two routes. Hmm? It used to have two routes. Oh, did it? Yeah, it used to go to the top of hill. It actually used to go to the farmer's market, but it was underutilized. Oh, okay. And, um, I mean, you know, I don't know what the issues are, but I think that there's probably a multitude of issues, such as it is a, um, it's not a bus. Right. It is a, um, so there's no heating, there's no right. air conditioning. Right. You know, it, it is a tourist attraction, oh, okay. right. and um, and I think that getting drivers is an issue. Um, the drivers that they do get are almost exclusively um, bus drivers for the school district, and so they 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 run the shuttles, you know, mm -hmm. when schools out, and um, and then and then you know just implementing um, a payment process, you know. That that I, I don't think that it's as simple as that sounds, you know. Um, I, I just I think that there's probably a lot of issues mm -hmm. with making it. Well, that's why around. I would yeah. like to try to learn yeah. more about it because, see, the, the very issue of heating and air conditioning in those I wasn't aware of. Um, yeah, they're definitely not the same thing as fair the, weather the climate <laughs> bus. They're <laughs> they're uh, kind of a hobby bus if you will so there's there are those issues but it's a I think tourist. I think we should maybe ask Nancy to share some of those um, obstacles with this group mm -hmm. the other thing that um, that came up was that uh, the city met with TriMet recently as well and I you know this is another area that we're kind of delving into with the transportation system plan but trying to get TriMet to um, return some of its routes, mm -hmm. serve our, our public better. Um, and uh, from what I understand, the meeting went really well. And TriMet pointed out that, you know, for the most part, there's a lot of their services, whether it be uh, um, park and ride parking or, um, you know, some of their lift service to um, people with special, you know, handicap needs. Um, just a better awareness back to that communication piece of what what they offer, you know, the community already that are underutilized, and um, so there's an ongoing dialogue with TriMet right now about how better to enhance their service and how better to get the word out about their existing service. So, and you know, some of that may cover some of this you know, downtown route mm -hmm. needs, shuttle, not necessarily shuttle service, but they cover some of the shortfalls of our trolley program in the wintertime. Well, and you can imagine, you know, five, ten years from now when Blue Heron is, you know, a major tourist attraction and, and boy, you know, something like a trolley would be, you know, uh, you'd have to have that almost, you know, to, yeah. uh, but, you know, it's, well, I don't know that much about it, so it would be good to learn more about it because, you know, like anything, sometimes you have where you build it and you hope they come and then they don't. And so, but yeah, more education would be good for us. Any other questions, comments on the trolley? Thank you for getting that schedule for us, John. Kathy did that. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> and you saw the revised, or not the, you saw the, uh, on here is the elevator hours, you know, the elevator hours change. 
In the summertime. In the summer, yeah. Yeah. Wednesday through Saturday. And on one side of the trial, uh, the schedule. Just extended hours on the um, elevator to allow for more pedestrian or you know, parking up here. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's on the map. It's, yeah, yeah, it's on the map. I didn't see that, Those actually. Those are extended hours. So now we can all go downtown and have dinners out the on the sidewalks. And, yeah. So the last item is just, I think, kind of an update. I think many of you probably know, but Nancy's, uh, Nancy Crush, our public works director, city engineers, leaving Oregon City for a uh, position in uh, Wilsonville. So her last day is July 2nd, and uh, Kathy's working on uh, invitations to um, kind of a meet and greet here here in the city commission chambers from 4 to 6. So you're all invited to that for sure. Many of you have worked working with, on it. Many of you have worked with Nancy over the years, so um, sh I know she'd appreciate seeing you. We're, um, it's going to be kind of informal. It's not necessarily a retirement, which, by the way, David Wimmer is retiring. Yep. Um, his his in, celebration is Thursday. Right, Thursday. from 4 to 6. 4 to 6, yeah. So He's the I, finance director, if people don't know. They're actually going to have guest speakers, and so there's a speaker. They're going to, that will happen at 5, I think what I saw. Is they'll, the speakers yeah. are scheduled to start at 5, so. The function is 4 to 6. What was the time and date for Nancy's again? July 2nd. From four to six. It, it, it's a Monday, and we know that July fourth is in there, but <laughs> it's the yeah. only day we can work it out. Yeah, there'll be notices sent out, obviously. Um, yeah, I'm actually putting together a list, and and it's going to be an email distribution. Sure. So, watch your email. <laughs> um, so anyway, in the interim, there's I'm going to do my best to um, step up and take on whatever um, you know whatever the call to duty is there for that position M what we're talking about now and I might talk about ramping it up even quicker is trying to uh, advertise for that position in early August um, and you know sometimes it takes a little time to fill those positions so um, that's kind of the plan at this point so in the meantime, we're not going to necessarily backfill any of the positions. We're just going to share the wealth around here as best we can. <laughs> but I can already tell after uh, after last week and this week when Nancy's not even left yet, um, it's you know as we're trying to transfer that workload in a in an organized fashion, it's, um, it's it's going to be a challenge. So certain things. I mean, one of the nice things about this committee not meeting in the summer is you know that's that's one little piece of, of the work that we, we Kathy and I won't necessarily We're have to lean. carry. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we are really lean. And, you know, at operations, you know, there was a lot going on there, too. So we're asking the operations supervisors to step up and hear, you know, Alita and Eric and John and, you know, Bob Cullis and all those, all those people who you may or may not know um, are all kind of taking a little piece of the pie. So keep that in mind when you're... I know volunteers can be more trouble than you know, but but if you know if there's anything that could be oh volunteers they, are they great they have us uh, they help us handle issues yeah so it's they help answer questions about what maybe we should do with regard to notification and involvement and you know there's there's a lot of good that comes out of our volunteers so I, I wouldn't squelch that it's just we have some good committee members here so we we want to just exactly. support you any way we can so. I go back to the trolley thing at, at some point we're not going to meet the the trolley runs during the summer we're not going to meet again until September so are you wanting to know more about it do you want us to have get a get a response from Nancy and just email it to you or do you want to hold off and have a discussion in September I think I would like to see both because then we would be able to form questions okay. from the email for the September meeting. So we'll ask her for an explanation and then we'll discuss it in September. 
That's my opinion. Yeah. Well, there may already be printed material that, that we're not aware of that will explain the you know, basics of the trolley program that maybe could be emailed out or that will give us a start. Yeah, I mean, this far into the – we are in summer, into the summer season. I don't see uh, major adjustments to that this summer, but maybe mm -hmm. the goal right. could be for next summer. Yes. Yeah, we could get into that 2035 plan, huh? <laughs> okay. One thing that's not on the agenda, but we're pretty proud of it, and it's on the web now, right? Mm -hmm. The 2010-2011 pavement maintenance fee annual report. So, mm -hmm. um, I did put it on the web. If you I had to think about it, that's good. good. Idea. If you're um, looking for data on what we've accomplished with our pavement maintenance utility fee, that's the place to go is on the web. And then you've got a copy of it. That's right. Mm -hmm. We distribute copies of that. So you don't even have to go to the web. But and, uh, Thank you for the pie chart. Yeah. yeah. The pie, yeah. Chart. The pie chart looks good, doesn't it? And yes. you may or may not realize it, but there's, actually, there's also a map that um, shows the PCI also. Um, it's exhibit B, and the as color, in boy. The color is map. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I guess it's intended to be printed as 11 by 17, but that's not how I printed these reports. If you wanted, if you wanted a report with full-size maps, let me know and I can give you a different, I can give you a, a different report. It's the same thing, just different size um, maps. What's chip seal? Chip seal is what you see on mostly county roads where they spray down a hot oil layer and then they cover it with fine rock. And, uh, and you have to go slow for a while? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you usually see it on your county road sections. We've done a little bit of it in town. Oh. I just see it on Holcomb Boulevard and I just bought a brand new car. <laughs> on that. I mean... The one just, little, just a comment. The one little benefit that we, uh, or the one, the one, what did I just say? The one problem that we have is we were counting on the camp. We were counting on the county to do our chip seals for us. They do it uh, every year. They've done it for us. What we've done it. We've done it the last three years. Um, and we pay them. We pay them. Yeah. So it's a, but it's a cost-effective way, and they're pretty good at doing chip seals. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this year, what we're hearing from them is they're not going to do chip seals, so that Holcomb work may or may not come together. Okay, any items for the good of the order? Comments? Let me ask a quick question. So, um, given the timelines for the transportation plan update, is there going to be another opportunity after this summer for this committee to sit down and as the committee look at it and bring forward a recommendation that goes to planning commission, city council, etc.? Or have we exhausted our opportunities to look at it and talk about it? Well, I think making a recommendation, let's just assume we get the comments that we want and we're happy with it and this committee's happy with it, then the schedule will allow for us to make that final recommendation for um, so that'll be sometime this fall for right? adoption yeah right um, but time to get together and figure out what kind of comments should be you know, the, uh, is that what you're asking about another opportunity to kind of get well, together this, this whole committee as a whole hasn't had an opportunity to discuss the document and we're the advisory committee that is designed to make comments about and make recommendations on transportation. So we don't have collectively any response to the document yet. Um, so I'm presuming that this advisory committee's recommendation would feed into the Planning Commission City Council and they'd make final decisions that we haven't made any collective recommendation yet. So are you, are you suggesting we might have a, a work session of some kind? And well, a work session, but I, I'm not, 
I'm not familiar enough. I, th I think they're trying to get this thing adopted by January or February, right? right. Yeah. So there may be time. I just, I just hope there may be time in September, October, for us to sit back and chew on it and make a committee recommendation. But I haven't seen anything like that or heard it talked I'm, about. I'm trying to think, Blaine. Maybe you remember, but we've got all new members. But um, when Kathy was chair. There was discussion at that time about how this committee should interface with uh, with the, uh, the the planning process, right, mm -hmm. for that document. Mm -hmm. And at the time, uh, everybody on there wanted uh, there wasn't there was, the decision wasn't to send you know one or two members to the stakeholder committee meetings. It was that everybody wanted some involvement and. Everybody was going to review to the degree they could the chapters, mm -hmm. and then utilize the the comment process. Now, the thing that's different for for one reason or another the the plan the the, uh, the consultant team and the way that scope work was developed, they have programmed into that a decision to, uh, or. They took it to the Planning Commission and they took it to the City Commission. They didn't t take it to the Transportation Advisory Committee, and uh, that—that's, you know, that's something maybe we could ask for at that time and have maybe even have a special meeting of this group to get your official group buy-in. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I think that that, that you know back when. Not Kathy. It was Mary. Mary, when Mary yeah, was right. um, chair. The decision wasn't to have special meetings and meet. You know, take up one of their, uh, take up one of these meetings to kind of discuss it. It was to participate, yeah. kind of individually on the on the groups. So I don't. I, I can respect that. Let me run a scenario by you. So, at the planning commission meeting, when they're looking at the final plan to make a recommendation to the city council. If it comes out that the Transportation Advisory Committee hasn't done anything with it, I think that may undermine what you're trying to accomplish. You know, regardless of what kind of recommendation we mean, it, for Joe Citizen who hasn't participated, who finally comes to the final hearing and doesn't see or see something he does not like in the plan and finds out that the group that's supposed to be looking at it never made a recommendation, that may be. Uh, Problematic, so I'm mean, just saying that's a logistical and a procedure thing that you may want to chew on with Nancy here before she takes off. Yeah, well, I know for myself it would be I would I would like to see a works. I, yeah, I wish there wasn't the kinds of uh, protocols and restrictions. You know, I'm kind of like to just get everybody together and you know just talk this through. But but uh, you know, but I think a work session would be helpful. Just so we have kind of a collective mind on on the transportation system plan as a whole, and then you know some nutshelling some recommendations. But yeah. Um, so so I'm what I'm hearing that. is we should probably have another meeting here, uh, at least specific to to the transportation system plan. Question is, do we have it early and earlier? In, yeah, I think I think if we wait beyond this, so we could. How about this? How about we look at the schedule? And figure out whether or not that meeting, meeting needs to happen this summer, or if it makes more sense to have that happen towards the, uh, you know, first part of the school year. That's fine with me. Yeah, either one, just okay. So, and we'll communicate that via email. Yeah, I think that would be helpful. Um, and then uh, we also have to, don't we have to make a recommendation tonight uh, uh, to uh, Mayor Neely uh, with regard to the applicant, uh, Bob? So. Correct? Yeah. I don't know. How did That's what we did. We did last we did time. Last we, time. We voted, so. Um, okay. So. You want me to leave the room? I'll be glad. You know, <laughs> it sounds bad, doesn't it, Bob? <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not in I think that, Bob. I think that would give the uh, the group a 
this uh, an opportunity to yes to well we, i think we did that one yes. more than the last the first one that we've given the boot uh, this meeting before. oh is that right well it's not the, i've been kicked out of better places than this <laughs> 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 thanks bob thank you bob thank you Okay, so uh, uh, we all had a chance to hear his responses. Any comments or questions or concerns? Well, he likes he likes to talk. There you go. But I, I think that he would be a good addition. He's got a lot of good experience in the planning area, which would should coordinate with mm -hmm. transportation issues. Yeah. Fred? I... I think he'd be awesome on this committee. Um, not that he would uh, take over being the chair or anything, but I mean, yeah. <laughs> no, I think he yeah, would be uh, really good to, uh, you know, be a liaison. I mean, all the stuff we were talking about. I was thinking about what he was, what he was saying as far as the planning commission and Wilsonville. Nancy's going to Wilsonville, and that's where he said was he started that up basically, and sure. that was great. And I, yeah, I. I vote. Okay, Steve. Two. I think he's a good candidate, and uh, we have some other people on the board that would would back up some of his views, mm -hmm. and I think he I think he'd be a good asset. John, that would be comfortable. Good, good sense of humor. So. Okay. So, do we uh, want to entertain a motion then to rec make a recommendation? I recommend that he. Uh, Say yes to Mayor Neely about him. Yeah. Okay. You have a second? I'll second it. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. So let me see if I have this right. We're going to have a retired city manager <laughs> and a former planning director on the committee. <laughs> That's right. Whoa, powerful, powerful. Good stuff, good stuff. <laughs> Help us out a lot. <laughs> can you handle this much? <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, I'm not territorial, so my, I, I can learn from them, so I, I feel privileged to have that kind of uh, all of you around, so that's great. Yeah. So, all right, well, with that, uh, unless there are any other comments, uh, meetings adjourned. All right. Thanks. Good input, everybody. Thank you. So just push the log out, right? Is that right? Did yes. that work? If you would please. That would be wonderful. Oh, wait.